And with that, it is my great honor and pleasure <laughs> to introduce Dr. James Doty. Um, Dr. Doty is a, <laughs> you can come up. Dr. Doty is a neurosurgeon, a compassion researcher. Um, he is the founding director of the Center of Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford University. He's also, <laughs> he's just showed me a screenshot of this. He's also the New York Times bestselling author of one of my personal favorite books, Into the Magic Shop, which has sold so many copies globally. And I know that I am one of many, many, many people, including others in this room, who have written him pages long testimonial emails <laughs> about the impact of the book on my life. So without further ado, thank you, Dr. Doty. Wow. Well, listen, it's uh, really an honor to be with you. And actually, thank you for that wonderful applause. But what I'd like you to do is to applaud yourself right now for being here because you've made the effort. So let's give each of ourselves an applause for our, our intention and uh, what we're going to do here. Uh, of course, at some point, you're all gonna rebel because we're gonna have you clapping all the time. You know, right? um, so thank you for that wonderful introduction, Ariel. It was uh, very kind of you. <clears throat> so I wanna make a couple comments first. And then I'd like to do a compassion exercise with you. How many of you are meditators? Wow, that's great. Uh, how many, it doesn't work as well as you'd like? <laughs> how many are self-critical? <laughs> if you're not raising your hand, you're lying. Okay. I'm just, <laughs> actually, that's like this joke where these... Uh, People ask vegans, they said, you know, are, are you a vegan? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But when they do the survey, 78% cheat, right? So, so I hate to say that. Um, anyway, <laughs> it's true. Uh, <laughs> first, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my own story, which I think relates to a little bit of what Ariel said. So my own background is I grew up in poverty. Uh, my family was on public assistance essentially my entire life as a child. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. My mother had a stroke when I was a child, was partially paralyzed, chronically depressed, actually attempted suicide many times. Uh, so you can see growing up in that environment, it's very challenging. And of course, as many of you know, we have this concept of adverse childhood experiences. And certainly I will assure you that I probably hit all 10 of those. So what was different for me? And I think this is something that's very important to this discussion because I, at the age of 12 actually, was in great despair, a sense of hopelessness, and uh, I had no mentors, no resources. But what happened was I walked into a magic shop, believe it or not, and the owner wasn't there, but his mother was there. And she was a woman who had this radiant smile that embraced you. And that radiant smile, that embracing, gave me a sense of psychological safety. And that is the key to us overcoming many of the issues related to the majority of cases of mental health disorders. And what this woman did was, believe it or not, after a conversation, she offered to spend time with me an hour or two every day for six weeks. And in that time, she taught me what is now called mindfulness. But it was more than mindfulness because it also included compassion for self and compassion for others. And when you are compassionate to yourself, it changes how you see others. You see, because when you beat yourself up all the time, then you can't see the lens clearly. And so that interaction made me believe that I actually had the potential to uh, go to college, med school, become a neurosurgeon, a successful entrepreneur, et cetera. Um, and that's what my book is about in part. But uh, the key points of this, which I want to point out, and I know they're policymakers here, a lot of mental health issues 
have to do with income inequality, poverty, and some of these other issues which society, for whatever reason, has chosen not to support. And it's ridiculous to think that after the fact that we're going to solve all of these problems. You know, we have to give people uh, a living wage. We have to give people access to childcare. Because you see, every time, and I know this myself because I saw it, was people who are incredibly intelligent, incredibly bright people, ended up becoming lost in the system because they gave up hope. And so I think this is incredibly important to think about in our discussions. Technology is not going to solve every problem we have in the world, nor in the mental health world. And I'm not saying that to be negative, but I think it's also a fact. The most important things in my own experience and what my research and the research of others is the following. The thing that is the best antidote to mental health problems is human connection, compassion, caring for others. And it's when you start looking through that lens that everything changes. But what has happened is in the modern world, unfortunately, it's going too fast. And our evolution has not caught up with our modernity. And we are using the same mechanisms which we used on the savannah in Africa to try to survive in this world, which the very nature of results in stimulation of our sympathetic nervous system and the whole consequence, negative consequences of that chronic stimulation. So I would suggest that if we can create tools that allow for somebody to be authentic, to allow people to not be judgmental towards others, that allow people to see the other as themselves, that will give us the greatest effect on mental health overall. And again, there are many solutions, there are a whole variety of uh, technologies, but the problem with many of these, and Ariel pointed out some of these is one, to be bluntly honest with you, for most people, therapy doesn't work that well. How many people are in therapy? And how many people feel that that's the greatest thing they've ever had? Oh, there's one hand. We'll say <laughs> two, 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 okay. <laughs> Maybe three or four. Uh, uh, but for many people, they don't even have access to that. They can't afford it. The other aspect is that pharmaceuticals, which, of course, the pharmaceutical industrial complex doesn't necessarily want to solve problems because then they have no customers, right? <laughs> And, but we also have medications that are marginally effective beyond the placebo effect. So we have to get back to the basic principles of how can we give people tools that will allow them to see the true nature of themselves, to be able to be authentic without fear of judgment, and is scalable and is readily available. Uh, because frankly, most people who are suffering oftentimes don't have the resources to help themselves. And again, the other aspect, as I told you from my personal journey, is one person reached out. And you see, we forget sometimes that each of us has the power to reach out to another person. You know, in our modern world, we walk by people, we ignore people, we're not interested because we think that next thing is more important. And as a result, as imagine, 25% of people in the United States have not a single person to talk to when they're in pain, when they're in suffering, when they're lonely. And of course, it's been, this has been exacerbated by the pandemic. So I think one of the most important gifts, at least in terms of what I can give you, is to make you understand the power within you to change people's lives. It doesn't take that much time. Sometimes it's simply a hello but it's making the effort to reach out to another person who is suffering or who you may not think is suffering. You know, you don't have to come from poverty to suffer. There are many children who grow up in affluent environments who suffer deeply. This is a universal problem. And also the most important thing is to be kind to yourself.
Because once you're able to get over the issue of I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm an imposter. And I know none of you have ever experienced that here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when you're able to love yourself, when you're able to sit there and say, yes, I'm not perfect. Yes, I've made mistakes. But I still deserve love. That is critically important because that will liberate you and it will allow you to see the true nature of reality. So thank you.